Marcus Sweeney, I mean, our old pal in one way um, and our old foe in another way. But Eamon, you were down in the high court for the cab listings and quite sensational stuff came out. Yeah, it was it was interesting, I have to say. Um, needless to say, Marcus Sweeney wasn't there. It was actually it was a it was a, an uncontested um, case uh, that cab had brought against his firm uh, EM or EWM which was, uh, I think, stands for Evergreen Wealth Management Properties Limited. Uh, and this, they basically were making the case that it was a, a money laundering vehicle for some very heavy criminals in Dublin. Um, and it centered around a particular piece of land. Like, a, it wasn't a huge sum of money. Um, I think it was something like 102,000 euro. Um, it was some, uh, it was basically a piece of land in, in County Meath. And it was just basically the, the criminal assets were, were looking to get a, a section three order, which would deem it the proceeds of crime. So then that brings you into this um, statement of belief from the, uh, the officers in the criminal assets bureau, which go on to give all their, uh, I suppose, evidence, you know, through affidavits about uh, the owner of the company, uh, which in this case is Marcus Sweeney. And about his involvement in crime. And it was it was quite the eye opener, I have to say. And absolutely. So. I suppose before we go on into delve into the details of this criminal assets bureau case against him, and you, as you say, the money maybe isn't the most sensational thing in the case. It's who is at the heart of it. Marcus Sweeney, for those who don't remember, one of the Celtic Tiger Cubs, a businessman in Dublin who had a restaurant. It was a socialite. He had a permanent orange sort of hue to him, um, and he was in a relationship famously with Katie French. Yeah, I mean he was. Uh the classic uh, Celtic tiger, uh, the face of the Celtic tiger, really for a lot the of the orange face, the, the orange face, tiger. the perma I perma. Are we the only country that would have had a orange faced face of well, any economic boom? But he could have, you know, he looked like something that could appear on a sitcom in the UK, nonetheless. He like looked like Liam Rowe. Do you know, I mean, that color that Liam Rowe has that he's kind of like he took a tablet or something at one stage and it just never left his system. But he kind of shot the fame there was a very famous incident he was gone out with Katie French who would ultimately uh, die um, as a result of cocaine abuse um, a very famous model um, but he really shot the fame because she, Katie French was with one of our sister papers shooting a, a doing a photo shoot with the Sunday Independent um, in his restaurant and he uh, came upon it obviously didn't know about it in advance and uh, she was posing in in, in her lingerie or whatever and he took grave offence and stopped the photo shoot uh, caused a ruckus and then sent her a series of texts which ended up in the media and it was a real kind of Celtic Tiger uh, story of mm. like this Marcus Sweeney like he looks I mean he really looks like the proper posh boy does he not and they've done a couple of pictures beforehand we just apprehended Dave Conicky in the office before we came into the studio just to you know, remind us yeah. our, you know about that incident and there was a photograph I remember of her and she was kind of looking a bit like that, you know, yeah. sort of, oh, sugar, I've been caught. But he was saying that they'd all set up, they'd done a couple of photographs that Marcus Sweeney came back and he asked her to go outside with him and they went into another room. They heard raised voices. And the next thing she came in and said to them, you're going to have to go, this has to finish. Um, she, there's some background story was that he didn't like her doing the lingerie modelling, even though when he met her, she was a lingerie model. Yeah. Uh, typical blokey, if you don't mind me saying so. I don't. Um, you probably do, but <laughs> anyway, I've said it. So yeah. um, he didn't like her doing that, and he, she had sort of promised to stop. But I mean, this obviously job came up. Sunday Independent, the biggest newspaper in the country. We're going back to what two thousand and six, seven. Yeah. Heyday of of the yeah. the newspaper industry being on the front page of the Sunday Independent could make or break you really. Yeah. Um, and you know she was undoubtedly. She was the most famous she model. She was publicity of, hungry, of, though, as well. Yeah, she was. And she was the most famous model of the type. Which these, these modeling jobs don't really exist anymore. They were. Yeah. These these models were hired to promote products, really, and then end up in the papers. It kind of Instagram has changed all that. Um, and so she became a genuine celebrity. But this was uh, 2007, as I said. It was before there was any rumblings about the Celtic Tiger going totally wrong. Yeah. And these were young people in their 20s. I mean, it seemed extremely posh. Um, and to think that 15 years later, we'd be connecting them with, uh, and obviously connecting him, Marcus Sweeney, with some of the most dangerous and 
Uh, uh, Biggest crime mobs in the country. Yeah, I mean, mm. it is quite incredible because that at the time it was a morality tale of young people with too much money and no worries mm-hmm. and all of that um, with Marcus Sweeney. But I have to tell this about Sweeney before we go back to Eamon for the details of the cab case. Now, I'm not going to be able to read this. You've printed it so small. But anyway, maybe you can help mm, me. Could be, yeah, it could so this is 2012 and I was writing this big investigation about the death of Katie French. Um, she had there had been an actual criminal investigation after she died. She had been taking cocaine in the home of a man called Kieran Ducey, known as the Wolf, another socialite around town and his house up in Kilmesson, she had collapsed, they brought her to hospital and she had she was very, very sick by the time she got into hospital. There was all sorts of investigations around where the cocaine had come from and, you know, the timeline to her. Ultimately, I think they ended up, the family having to turn off the machine. Horrendous story. But um, so all these people were kind of caught up in this investigation, including Jim Mansfield Jr., who she'd been dating. And Katie French had had this big party in in Dublin, which was attended by all the media. She had got out of the car in this beautiful gold dress. She was looked as if she was at the absolute height of her career. And she had, um, you know, afterwards been very upset because Mansfield Jr. didn't show up. And he apparently was trying to keep his reputation clean from the fact that she was a cocaine user. But anyway, Marcus Sweeney was one of those that was interviewed in the aftermath of her death for this thing. And he gave this really nasty statement about her and he talked about her having this insatiable appetite for cocaine that he basically couldn't keep up with her. Can you read that? Have you better eyesight than me? If you've one eye gone. (laughs) This is where where, where he was actually talking about. He used it as a social drug, but said that she had bigger issues. And he said um, Katie had no limit when it came to coke. She never wanted to stop, always wanted more. So it it was a pretty not exactly the most sensitive thing to be saying immediately after someone's death. Can I just say to anybody who doesn't know Eamon, that sums Eamon up there. You just saved the day. <laughs> you whizzed in. She got, the two of us are squinting here I incapable know. of I reading know. this. And you have it in front of you. And that's exactly what it was. It was mean, wasn't it? It was a nasty kind of a thing to say about her that, you know, and it was like as if he was so clean cut and he wasn't able to deal with her because she was so into this sort of drug use and you know he he would just sort of ha- he had to break up with her and here we are and you're sitting at court the other day and all of a sudden we realise this guy is couldn't be in actual fact in the words of the judge up to his oxers yeah I mean well done to judge Alex Owens he he kind of gave us all a, an easy headline this week um, but he, he was summing up and he was granting the order to the Criminal Access Bureau to deem the this, this piece of land in Waynestown in County Meath as the proceeds of crime. And he said Sweeney was up to his oxters with organized crime. And, you know, he just, he just basically, he more or less said the whole thing was proved, really. Um, I mean, they went through, though, um, it, it, it was a real insight into, uh, like, you know, what happened after the Celtic Tiger, I think, to some extent. Um, and one of the things that I know we had previously, there was various stories about where is Marcus Sweeney now in, in other newspapers. And there's one you know, suggestion that he'd gone into, you know, he had his gym, as you mentioned already. Um, and then there was also, he was involved in, in selling cars. But what was in the cab case this week, he actually helped set up Platinum Motors uh, for Brian Grendon, one of the leading members of the family, which is the, the, the a serious drugs gang that we're, we're talking about. And and that that company, Platinum Motors, was separately a target for cab and in 2018 was served with an income tax demand for 500,000. So, you know, he, he was he was in bed with some serious individuals. Um, and even like, you know, again, it, it was mentioned about his his he had a meeting one time with Brian Grendon in, in the car park in Liffey Valley. Uh, this is in 2019. And uh, what he didn't realize at the time was that Grendon was actually under surveillance by the guards. And not only that, but he went on then directly from that meeting to meet two Turkish criminals in, in a, I think, in a nearby hotel. And when they went on, when they moved off all under surveillance, um, the, the guardie raided the, the B&B where the two Turkish men were staying and found just almost a million euro worth of heroin in 14 half kilo blocks that um, it turns out one of these guys had had pretty much effectively been on the run from the UK and the NCA, the, the UK's National Crime Agency, had asked, had asked their counterparts here in, in, in Ireland to keep an eye on these guys. 
and this is what they came up with so i mean it, it wasn't small time what he was at you know even if he ne wasn't necessarily um getting a, a chunk of the money or anything but he was involved in some serious criminality so i mean for judge alex owens to say he was up to his oxters is is possibly a little bit of an understatement I mean, you can't get bigger than the Grendons. They're currently the number one target of the Drugs and Organised Crime Bureau in the country, and they have been since back in 2019. Yeah, I mean, it's quite a it's quite an effort for people like Marcus Sweeney, who come from a certain section of society, mm -hmm. to actually come across these people and then get embedded in with them. Like, it is very, very uncommon. I mean, most of drug crime, people grow up around these things and they get sucked into a life. To actually go and seek it out is very rare, I would think mm. it's fair to say. Um, there was always a funny suggestion, though, around around the Katie French. After Katie French died, you did see this kind of intermingling of a couple of worlds. Um, you had people like Lee Cullen, who's currently serving, I think it's an 18 year sentence in the UK um, for weapons offences, who ended up working for Bomber Kavanaugh for the most time. He seemed to be hanging around with these people as well. So there was a couple of people straddling this world. And obviously, Mansfield, of course, who was at the head, neck and tail of it. Obviously Mansfield. I mean, so there was a, a, a and all this kind of came out in the aftermath um, that that these people who were coming from that background had kind of intermerged with, with, with some of these high society people. It was, but it, yes, to see Marcus Sweeney, who, who, whatever you want to say about him, he doesn't look like a criminal, the criminal type. I mean, to, the, the, that you brought up Lee Cullen, just to remind anybody, Lee Cullen was this car dealer at the time around the 2006, 2007 time when Katie French had been going out with Marcus Sweeney and then went out with Jim Mansfield Jr and was been photographed with them and she was the most famous model and everything. When she died, she was in a car that was registered to Lee Cullen or yeah. owned by Lee Cullen. And she was also living in an apartment that was owned by Jim Mansfield Jr. Yes. And when Mansfield was questioned in relation uh, when when the state, you know, launched this investigation into where she got the cocaine, you would have to wonder now yeah. Was that really to go after the guy who sold her the line or was there obviously suspicions around all these people around her and there, perhaps they thought there was a bigger Yeah, there was there was bigger prize. Yeah. Um but she was living in this apartment owned by Mansfield and Mansfield at the time when he was questioned said, uh, yeah. Uh, I remember he, he, he had in his statement sort of said that yes, he had been seeing her a bit, that he wasn't really that interested in her. Um, and that he certainly didn't want to be brought into the limelight. He didn't want to be photographed when he went out. And he said to the guardy that he had, she was living in one of his apartments, but that he owned 220 of them. So it didn't really matter to him, basically. This was just one of 220. And again, when you see within a couple of years, the Mansfield Empire goes wallop and they own nothing. Yeah. They're struggling to, to scrabble a couple of little assets back. So, I mean, Lee Cullen was for all intents and purposes at that stage, a legitimate car dealer. Um, he was, you know, he really successfully straddled that world. But there was always rumours about about uh, about the source of some of his wealth. Um, and ultimately what we what we came to realise was that he became deeply embedded with the Kinahan cartel and ended up owing them a huge amount of money, um, in particular to Bomber Kavanaugh, although he was associating with other people. And what's happened to... to to Lee Cullen is an example of what does happen when they get these guys get embedded with the with people of that criminal pedigree. Mm. That Bomber Kavanaugh seems to have uh, physically, personally beat him up a couple of times. He seems to have ordered him to come over to Birmingham, and Lee Cullen seems to have ended up working as a dog's body for the cartel to try and work off a, a what we heard at the time was a seven uh, seven figure debt. Um, really seems to have been effectively tortured over mm. a period of time by the, the bomber Kavanaugh gang. Um, so Katie French was associating with these people. Now, nobody is suggesting Katie French was anything other than what she was. She was a innocent young girl. We kind of got sucked into some of that lifestyle and these people were maybe feeding off her celebrity and the glamour attached to her. Um, there was also talk that of... John Kinsella being around them. John Kinsella was a former uh, professional boxer, 
talented boxer who ended up ultimately serving a lengthy sentence for heroin importation, which um, after a lot of a big load of heroin was found on a on a plane flying into um, into the private airport at the time. It was in Belgium, I think it hadn't taken hadn't off. Taken right? off. It was due yeah. to it was due to land in Ireland into Weston. So all of these people were 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 in the ether around them, but Marcus Sweeney obviously. There were colourful years. Like there were colourful years. Marcus Sweeney, when you know, when you went to cover the 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 cab listings this week, and we realised that Marcus Sweeney's company was on it, I was like, oh, because back in 2019, I think it must have been when he was, the the Grendons were under surveillance. I had had a tip off that he had been liaising with them and that he was involved. In actual fact, he was questioned when those two Turkish guys you're talking about, Eamon, Ali, Adnan and Duran and another guy were, were arrested with those drugs, the heroin. And um, Marcus Sweeney's house that he was living in at the time was searched as part of that investigation. And he was questioned, certainly, as regards his movements. Yeah. I'm not sure he was arrested, but he well, was certainly questioned. But um, I was like, you know, I knew he was kind of in the mix of sort of dodgy types but yeah. I was like there's no way he's he, he was actually arrested oh, at he the was time arrested. After, after that meeting yeah with um, Brian Grendon he, he then went on and it was Kuldip Singh who's from Birmingham and Turkish national Ali Duran um, who, who I think they got he, one of them got four years and the other got nine years for the for the million quid's worth and I think then Ali Duran was also wanted in the Netherlands so he's still in prison in Ireland I think at this stage um, but he'd be extradited back then to Holland to, to finish off there. But it was one of the points there, I think, that uh, Niall brought up there about, about, you know, people like Lee Cullen and, you know, uh, and Marcus Sweeney is that there, there are so many of these people, you know, involved in business who are enablers for, I guess, the hard men of, of, of the, uh, you know, the criminal underworld, that they need these front men, these, you know, basically these guys with the permatans and the, yeah. the nice hairdos and, and, you know, the gold jewellery who can go out and sell a car, but they can also try and pass off a front business as a legitimate, uh, you know, as a legitimate enterprise when it's all about trying to launder what we know is, is huge sums of money. I mean, like it, it actually, it, it came out as well, like in, in the cab hearing this week. I mean, like like Marcus Sweeney's associations were gone through and there was, there was one particular suspected drug dealer um, who, who had invested something like half a million with Evergreen there was another gentleman who, who was suspected of being involved in laundering 1.42 million euro worth. And then there was another another man that we've, we've written about on occasion in the Sunday world. I think he was actually a victim of an assault, Oshin Legaspi. And he, he was named in one of the affidavits as, as having been a supplier of vehicles and a business advisor to a number of garages operated by organized crime groups, including the Kinhen and the Grendon organized crime groups. So a lot of these gangsters wouldn't survive without these soft underbelly businessmen who can go out and, you know, clean the, you know, clean the checks. And then there's the added fact, no more than Lee Cullen found out that if things go wrong, you're, you're going to get the crap beaten out of you because you're, you're not tough enough. You haven't come up from, from that side of things. You're, you're there to sell cars or you're there to, to be front of house and to meet and greet. And that's something that happened, uh, we know now, to Marcus Sweeney, that he, he was given a, a guard a gym notice, which is a notice to say that there's an immediate threat to your life. Um, this is, I think, it, it was certainly happened by the early, early 2020 or late 2019. And the guards believe that he and uh, another man basically went and had a sit down with their creditors, so to speak, um, and that there was the, there was a repayment schedule uh, supposedly you know organized and how they were you know an, an acknowledgement that the debt was there and that really it was all about satisfying Brian Grendon and making sure he gets his money back which i think you know when you're when you're a suit when you're a salesman who probably and started started this road with a probably too much of a of a cocaine habit and a bit of a debt and you get sucked in i mean that's the that's probably a hollywood version of the easy the lazy writer's way of getting people into into um into serious criminality but uh really what it leads down to is that you're you're disposable and that if so what if you get caught so what if a couple of hundred grand goes missing here or there they'll break your neck to get it back if yep. they have to but in the meantime they've they've already salted away a couple of million euro like you're a hundred percent nail on the head with that because it was definitely and i was going to say there that marcus sweeney while i knew he was tricky 
when I had heard at that time about his association with the Grendons with these two Turkish heroin dealers and I had heard that he had a gym form and for anybody who doesn't know what that is it's a Garda information message which is basically informing an individual of a credible threat to their lives and he was living up in Meath at the time and I went up there um, to try and speak to him basically to ask him to see would he collaborate the story or in any way say that yes he was you know, his life was under threat, they never got near him. And in the end of the day, our lawyers anyway, basically said, uh uh-uh, uh, that ain't going into the paper. Totally understandable until we have the backup of the likes of the court documents, Eamon, that you have uh, today, so as we can talk about this kind of thing, where our, our hands are tied somewhat. But Oshin Legaspi, who was a friend of Marcus Sweeney's and is this car dealer who has been, he, he deals in, in very luxurious, very high end cars, and probably that's what brought him into contact. You can see easier how he came into contact yeah. with these people with money. I was also at Legaspi's house a number of times. Um, yeah, I mean, he appeared... And he Legaspi, was on a gym form too. And he appeared in, in connection with the cab case against the Burns and, and, yes. and their, their he car provided business. provided one or two cars. He provided were, one or two cars. and provided, he was, sold. Yeah, sold. and he was questioned and uh, about, you know, the origin of these cars and where they ended up. So he seems to be in floating around there. But again, he but his car was firebombed one night in his very, uh, very middle class home in a very, very middle class estate in South County Dublin. And it was all part of that. He was he was on this gym because obviously he had been sucked into whatever was going wrong between the Grendons yeah. and Marcus Sweeney. And, and it's very like uh, Daniel Kinnan. People always say that he's so charming and nice and he gets these people into that, sucked into that world. But if something goes wrong, mm. I mean, they are absolutely ruthless. And these people aren't made for that that life. You know, they yeah. might they may think they're best friends with this guy, but once they owe them a few thousand, yeah. the pressure come, the pressure, the, the 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 situation changes totally. Absolutely, and the few t- thousand turn into multiples of that very quickly because, of course, you know, most of this money wouldn't be, you know detailed on a piece of paper or through a bank account or no it's amazing is there any details Eamon of that about how the Grandons invested that money or was there there must have been obviously a paper trail that the cab now know about yes, it's, 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 some of it was was simply cash payments um, I, 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 what um, what Sweeney did was they, they, they used false lodgement dockets uh, and he admitted that in a guard a statement him and, a, and, a, and another man uh, and they're, they're, the guards were able to trace back some of this cash directly to Brendan uh, to Grendon, and they also they also realised that he used one of his companies, BG Autos. He, he put twenty thousand uh, into Evergreen, which is the, the, this investment company, uh, through through that company. But they they also they said in the affidavits they also suspect that uh, significantly higher cash amounts were invested by Brian Grendon. Uh, we, there was a, there was a, according to the paper trail, there was something like uh, seven hundred thousand, just over seven hundred thousand cash lodgements to the bank accounts of Evergreen Wealth Management from unknown sources um, between June twenty fourteen and April twenty twenty. So that's six years. There was seven hundred thousand. So I mean, it, it, you can imagine that's that's probably what you know for the likes of the, the Grendons is, is not even a, a week's a week's worth of business. Mm-hmm. I'd say. So I mean, in one sense, it's a relatively small uh, case that the the the, the criminal assets bureau have bought, but it's significantly disruptive. I think, um, you know, and and, and certainly it, it it makes it harder for them to know that they they have to be constantly on their toes. It, you know, there's no easy way of laundering money anymore. And does it not make the likes of Marcus Sweeney toxic to most business people in this country? Anybody who'd want to invest with them. Well, I think it definitely does. But you made a comment it, earlier about yeah. people when they start. <laughs> no, I was saying it's not good news when people start appearing in no, the Sunday No, I world. mean, it's <laughs> amazing. Like if you could go back, I mean, these people are appearing in the paper one way or another for 20 years now. Like Brian Grendon first yeah. in the in the Sunday world in 2002 and Marcus Sweeney so many times. So, yeah, it's, not, mean it's, it's never going to end well when you start. I, I wouldn't. Yeah, I don't. It's not depending a, it's not on which news. side of the paper you're exactly, in. If you're in the back exactly. pages, you're OK. Yeah. Middle pages, you're OK. But the front pages. But it's 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 get rich quick, isn't it? And that yeah. in a part that was, you know, some of the Celtic Tiger, which of course did as much damage some of the the financial speculation that uh, as any as anything to this to the fabric of this country. But you know, it, the Celtic Tiger attracted a lot of get rich quick people, mm. um, people of professional people, solicitors, etc. 
um, and Marcus Sweeney was one of them and while there was get rich quick going on in the, the world of property and, and showbiz he went for that mm. but when that ended he obviously ended up trying to get rich quick through through the drugs trade um, and but the likes of him and he would have been knocking around and obviously lilies and all the rest of it which we all probably knocked around in at one point but uh, there I don't, no, know, I don't know if I'm I don't know did you not either <laughs> oh I definitely did <laughs> I did it. I was just the typical. Yeah, no. You could have written my story. Yeah, Eamon story didn't actually, necessarily you know. grace the doors of Lily's on a regular did, basis. Eamon. Re- Reynards? <laughs> no, I've never. Nope. Ah, seriously. <laughs> more, more humble. Well, he's not from Dublin, I suppose. You're a culture, really. So I'm sure there's a name of some place down near you. If I knew it, I'd be able to, you know, John Joe's or something. <laughs> The sheep dip. Yeah. yeah. No. <laughs> and as for you. Well. No, we won't go into your no. dodgy past. But anyway, um, but th- what I was going to say, and it'll be news to both of you then if you haven't been. There were these kind of types that were always knocking around that, um, you know, you could go out and have a night out. But then there was the ones who always had to be buying the 10 bottles of champagne. And it was every night. Yeah. And it was th- these socialites that to show off and to be surrounded. They almost bought friends around them. Um, Kieran Ducey, who is still uh, in Kilmessen in County Meath, as far as I know, certainly the last yeah. time, and not in great health the last time I saw him, but he was an absolute, you know, nicknamed the Wolf. He was going from one club to the other, and that was exactly his modus operandi. He would be the one to buy the cocaine, to buy the VIP tables. He'd be picking up women along the way to surround himself with. Like something lacking really there, yes, isn't there? Yeah, and now, that, that, that bit you can both, <laughs> you can both understand. I do, I des- We're not like that. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> but he had a great desire to be in the papers, Kieran Ducey. And, yeah. And, you know, to, to, to appear in VIP pages and... And, and to look and like the man stuff. with the money, to look yeah. like the success. It doesn't actually these people seem to matter what's actually going on no. in your life internally or in your relationships around you um, but it's this just this facade the facade and uh, that's an achievement in itself the facade yeah you know. but what does it all amount to 10 years later yeah. absolutely nothing you know well this is it um, now at the very other end of the scale and that's what I love about these cab lists Eamon was uh, the Maguires who were very unsophisticated. Probably um, never appeared in Lilies in their lives. They never went to Lilies, I'd say, in their lives, but they, unfortunately for that, they have been appearing in the pages of the Sunday World for quite some time. Now, they weren't there to contest this case because both would probably remain under threat of life. No, I, they just really didn't enter a defence at all. Um, in fact, they just tried to ignore the entire proceedings. I think like the, the case kind of was started to move fast, uh, you know, towards the end of last year and the guards had to go back, keep going back to the to where um, Owen McGuire is living and they'd knock on the door and, you know, somebody would answer and say, no, he's not here. And, and this went on and on, you know, three or four times. Uh, he's not here. He's gone to the physio. He's gone to his mother's. You know, they, I don't have his phone number. You know, he doesn't live here. All, all this kind of stuff. And they knew he was inside. Um, they knew all along he was there. They'd get it on one occasion. Some of the officers were abused by a by a, a, a distant relative, so they ended up having to go to court and saying, "Look, can we just leave a box of the documents on his doorstep? And is that you know, can we be deemed served the legal papers then at that point?" So that was allowed. And in the meantime, Brendan, his brother, was tracked down to his new home in Rochdale, just outside of Manchester, and uh, it was agreed then that he could be served abroad as well. So they were both deemed served. Um, that evidence was given uh, again this week, and they went through then the entire litany of, I suppose, the, again, what's known as the belief evidence to kind of show that, you know, the Maguire brothers were part of a criminal enterprise and that they couldn't have got the money from any other place except from from crime. And they were basically described as the you know, leading figures in the Price Maguire organized crime gang. They were controlled drugs in Drogheda, Louth, Eamon, Dublin, Meath. Just before you go on, is that the first time that that has been named as that joint operation like the I've never heard that before I've heard of the Maguire side and of course these are all people you know on one side of the the Drogheda feud which maybe we'll go over in a minute but the Price Maguire organized crime group I've never heard that term yeah I mean this came yeah this would have come out in you know in the course of this case um say from about last October and it, it very much it kind of it even went through 
about how um, following, you know, a totally unrelated, there was there was a double shooting and the, all of a sudden there was there was a gap in the market, which the Maguires, particularly Owen, went out to try and fill. And and in the course of that, around 2004, it was introduced to Cornelius Price and they got on like a house on fire in terms of gangland criminality and never looked back and became increasingly, increasingly violent, increasingly successful at what they were doing. Uh, uh, and again, all of this was all of this was laid out in in the case to persuade the judge that you know the, these these people aren't involved in anything normal. Then they don't have a, a regular business. They would say things like they're involved in car dealing or scrap metal, but there was no documentary proof. Even you know, not that they cooperated, but the guards couldn't find anything to show that they ever had a, a legitimate job. And there was even times when they weren't even on social welfare. So where did they? Where did the, this cash come from? I mean, one of the sums, uh, one one of the the items, I suppose, that was at at, at stake in in this particular hearing was two hundred and seventy thousand euro that was hidden, you know, under the tiles of you know a property belonging to a family member, and nobody even came forward to claim it, um, and the, it was also wrapped in bundles, which you know in itself the way it was hidden in a, in a, a concealed hide, the way it was wrapped up, and the fact that no one came forward was pretty indicative that. This money didn't come from doing anything good, but they were named as as like the major, you know, a major regional drug dealing gang, uh, and they listed. I think it was something like seventy one violent criminal incidents they were involved in, um, and and these included murders, um, arson attacks on homes, you know, serious assaults. You, you know, you, basically, you, you, I mean, we're all aware of of what went on in the in the the Drogheda feud. So all of this was used as background to show that they, they were involved in serious criminality, apart from the fact that both Owen and Brendan had been had been shot by assassins and in Owen's case left paralyzed and is now in a wheelchair and in uh, Brendan's case a short time after his brother was was shot um he wasn't as badly injured but in in, in you know you don't get shot because you're a window cleaner or because you're 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 dealing in scrap metal I mean, certainly you know this is this is it was actually his it was actually the shooting of Owen that really kicked off the the draw a few that I think most people would be aware of at this stage I mean, it's very, I mean, the fact that they didn't get legal aid is becoming a big feature in these cab cases because they're just not being contested, as you see with these two cases this week. Did they look for it? Well, I think they, I don't know if they looked for it. They didn't look for it, but the fact that the legal aid isn't coming through is really expediting them, isn't it? Well, there's been different cases. I mean, like uh, until recently, legal aid wasn't allowed, but then there, there was some changes in the interpretation of of um, what you're allowed legal aid for. So in some cases, you can make the argument, which certainly Mago Gately has been doing, that well, look, we we need to get a forensic accountant, and they don't come cheap. So we can can we get legal aid just at least for that, and a solicitor to handle that part of it, as opposed to you know other parts of of trying to rebuff the affidavits coming from the Criminal Assets Bureau, which you can get specific legal aid for for certain things. But I, I, in terms of the Maguires, they just didn't engage. They they just you know put their 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 head in the sand and try to pretend it wasn't there. Literally try to pretend nothing was happening. It was nothing to do with them. I don't I don't think they're too worried. You know uh, I mean I think you know it was a a, a one seven one Mercedes Benz a one three one Ford Transit. Um, and then cash of you know totaling three hundred thousand, a Rolex watch worth sixteen and a half. I, I, you know, you get the feeling that they can afford to lo- they can afford to lose that, and that's you know it, it's it's no big deal. And why go through the stress or the bother, you know, or and even as you say, you know, open yourself up open to the risk of being got at if you're if you're going to start appearing at you know in court at a certain time on a certain date. Well, this is it. And just two things there, the legal aid. Firstly, like from a journalistic point of view, sometimes when they make the legal aid applications, we get loads of detail yeah. because the cab will fight them yeah. all. They have started robustly fighting legal aid applications. Of course, John Gilligan got legal aid uh, at the very beginning of it went his, for 20 that went years. on and caused a state of fortune. So they do robustly uh, fight them. And in doing so, they will put evidence of lifestyle before the court. So in the case of the Byrne Organised Crime Group and a number of them applied for free legal aid in the beginning, um, like the, when that case, the, the legal aid case has been fought, this was just like a treasure trove to journalists. This yeah. was... Uh, the holidays they were going on, this was the cars they were driving, their social welfare payments, everything, stuff that we still rely upon and lean on when we're writing about them or describing them. But um, the other thing I kind of want to talk about a little bit is the difference between the likes of Marcus Sweeney, the sophistication of this sort of socialised businessman uh, and those around him setting up legal, legitimate businesses and that money being 
filtered through it, uh, hidden to purchase lands and this, that and the other. And the lack of sophistication of the Maguire faction hiding the money literally in the attic in yeah. cash. Yeah, I mean, it's a phenomenal amount of money, like 200. What does it look like? <laughs> Again, no idea. <laughs> well, there was, I never know. And, and like, and to even to, to show the lack of sophistication, um, like the two properties that were involved in this were, I think, a cottage, one in one in Monaghan and, and one in um, Cavan. And uh, they had, I think, at one point they did, they were talking to, to to guards, and they said they didn't own any property in Ireland, and they were literally both on the land register for these properties. So there was no attempt at you know getting a third party to to put their name to the property or to use a front company or anything like that. It was, it was literally their name was on it. So you couldn't get you couldn't get any less sophisticated really than that. But and it have does you show been to Cement Road in Drogheda? Yeah, it's I, I have. mean that's where they where, where they live which was be a state um, built it, Yeah, it's a it's a purpose that, built that, that was that was where that was where um Owen was living uh, when he was shot. And it, it's 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 actually sealed off now. It's and, and where they're living is a slightly different place. It's okay. also on Cement Road but it's further up. And there's other family members there, and and actually, it's like one of the things that came out was that when he when he was found, you know, shot and badly wounded, which you know, like which is alleged or it's not alleged, it's it's the guards are pretty convinced it was Robbie Lawler who carried out the shooting, but uh, that was the the transit van he just got out of um, oh, really? when he was shot, and that was the transit van that was you know the subject of the cab hearings. It should go into the Gangland Museum, eh? Yeah, <laughs> but it does show you the the regional drugs gangs. You know the boom. There's it's been boom time for them, a sort of secondary boom, mm. and there's all of a sudden huge amounts of money to be made and networks to grow. And the Maguires, maybe it's not fair to say they came out of nowhere, but they really shot the prominence and managed to 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 grab a slice of lucrative territory. But similar, I suppose, to the Dundon gang of Limerick, they don't seem to show that money laundering sophistication that. With the given the amount of money they're making, they need to have as yeah. part of their business. Yeah, and also just the, their their use of violence seems to be yeah pr- quite indiscriminate. Primary. So, yeah, yeah, and I mean, which is what happened to 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 the Dundon gang, like they were extremely violent and generated a huge amount of fear. But it was unsustainable, I suppose, if you compare it to people like Brian Grandin, who has been. I mean, I think it was two thousand and two, and he was convicted of of heroin trafficking. But he manages to stay for twenty years at the top of the criminal, mm. the criminal game without ending up before courts all the time, and and he, obviously he's become a big focus at the moment. But these these sort of regional gangs like the Dundons, they're not as sophisticated, and they tend to uh, burn out quickly. And there's some sense of that happening in Drogheda as well. The Drogheda feud is sort of abated, even though, you know, touch wood, you say the same for the Hutch Kinnahan feud. Just haven't seen the no, kind of levels I of violence. You talked about 70 odd incidents of, of attacks, murders, etc. in those cab files. I think when a, f- a certain amount of people get put behind bars, it really does manage to slow down the whole process. And, and we know that some of the principals involved are, you know, have left the country. Um, the likes of Cornelius Price is is in a coma. He suffered l- limbic encephalitis, which put him into a coma, and he's seriously ill. He was due to stand trial in the UK over a, a, a tiger kidnap plot, but he's he's been too ill to actually um, be you know to go on trial. So you have that. You have Brendan has left the country, and you have Owen Maguire is, is paralysed in a wheelchair. Although you know we're told certainly sources are saying that he's he's still involved in. He's still involved in in gangland activity, and we just recently, you know, he's been blamed for an attack on on a grave of all things in in Longford over a perceived insult. So he's still able to, I guess, you know, call up Russell up a couple of uh, heavies to do a bit of damage when he needs to. So presumably, if he's able to do that, he still has some clout, which in gangland terms means you have money. Who was that Eamon in the the grave? It was, it was a gentleman called uh, Joe McGinley, who's uh, like who who was buried there I mean and has no involvement in crime you know it's just a, a, an or, or ordinary sort of uh, gentleman but um, one of his sons um, you know I, I would have had a bit of a reputation as a, as a bare knuckle fighter and the story is that uh, well the sources were telling me that there was a row over hunting dogs and rabbits or something like that and uh, he, he said something he, he said something insulting towards or, or about Owen Maguire who heard about it and was apparently furious over this and so the easiest way of getting back is to smash up a grave which seems to be a bit of a 
bit of a thing these days. There's been a number of those incidents around. I know in some of the feuding clans in, in Ennis recently set fire to one, piled up some plastic rubbish or whatever and tried to set fire to someone's grave. And there's been other there's been other kind of memorials toppled over. And when you consider that in some cases this couple of hundred thousand spent on these, it is it's 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 quite a bit of uh, damage to have to, mm. to suck up if it happens to you or your family. I don't know. What's I don't know. going on with Owen Maguire? <laughs> like, he just needs to go no, get some anger management and stuff, doesn't he? Yeah, I mean, it was funny. Uh, these things go up on TikTok as well, where uh, yeah. the, Mr. McGinley puts up a TikTok, you know, blaming Owen Maguire. And, you know, it's it's just the modern world again, you know. You know, in criminality terms, not to make light of it, but it looks it's almost sort of childish. Well, it's, uh, yeah, it's a certain amount of uh, bravado, though, in it, isn't mm. there? Like of calling somebody out directly, personally and to the camera, you know. But yeah, it's, 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 it's the lower end of it. I mean, if, if, you, if you think about it in terms of corporate, like, you know, you have you have your international corporate, you know, boardroom CEOs and corporate raiders and, you know, the likes of Daniel Kinnan and Christopher Kinnan and people like that or you know, George Peng, you know, the Penguin George Mitchell. You know, and then at the at the bottom of it, then you have the likes of the Dundons and the uh, uh, and the Maguires, and essentially they're they're kind of senior junior management to some extent. They're 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 making decent money, but the chances are that their, you know, cocaine or whatever it is they're buying is coming through. You know, someone like Mister Big or one of the the Kinahan, you know related OCGs, and and even even the Dundons for years, we we know now like that, that there was there was certain you know monster criminals who who pretty much rename nameless and still we can't really name them either now, and they were the ones all along supplying uh, these people, and in some cases we were playing sometimes supplying both sides of two gangs who were feuding against each other. Mm. We'll move on, and we'll go to our favourite. Which we haven't touched for t- it's like it's like as if we've sort of cut the cord here, <laughs> but which we haven't. We're going back to Jerry Hutch trial next week because I think that the closing statements are going to be made. And I said to you for the last couple of weeks there wasn't enough evidence really to warrant a full podcast. We'd have been going back over stuff that we've been through and through and through. We were very very thorough with everything uh, in the run up to Christmas, and we'll be very thorough next week when these yeah. closing statements come in because they will interest people yeah. but just to give a quick roundup I suppose of the Regency murder trial and Eamon feel free to chirp in here whenever you want um, what was the kind of main points and areas of evidence over the last couple of weeks well there's today for example there's been a huge amount of mobile phone evidence um, which I'd say is extremely technical for almost anybody. So the, the the basic trust of it is that mobile somebody uses a mobile phone and you can't necessarily find that phone directly, but you can find what cell tower it was using. Right. So when the, you're using it or when you make a call and when you hang up? Well, I think a bit of both actually, um, because uh, no, when you make a call, probably it, you can get it more directly. But when you're, as long as you have your mobile phone on, they can it, it constantly your mobile phone constantly bounces off the nearest cell tower mm. so that's when you see the, the the line showing your your phone has has coverage it's constantly checking your mobile phone so they're trying to determine Jonathan Dowdle's movements uh, and J- Jerry Hutch's movements um, through these cell towers which won't show exactly where he is but it'll show his movements on the day and um, again a lot of it comes back to Jonathan Dowdle's statement about whether when he met allegedly met Jerry Hutch in Whitehall in a park where Jerry Hutch allegedly confessed to involvement in the Regency. The defence are bringing up inconsistencies in Jonathan Dowdle's timeline, which is really what he has said in the statement initially was that it was the day after the the Sunday World appeared. The day after the, the Monday? The Monday. Then he has clarified that he's not sure if it was that Sunday or the Monday. So they're going through a lot of this. I mean, I don't fully understand it, and I don't think you'd want to hear the the the, the technicalities uh, of it. No, no absolutely not. So we don't need to know that ever. Hopefully. So that was a big feature. Um, yeah. Then also, um, uh, one of the guards was brought through some of the other incidents um, involving the 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 YouTube uh, a, a video on that was put put on YouTube by. One of the bystanders in the, at the boxing way. And why the were they asked about that? Was that because it was an offence to put that up on YouTube, or why? Not really. I think, and they also were asking about the the Sunday World again yeah. featured um, 
and also the uh, an article by Ken Foy, who's yeah. been a regular on, on Crime World as well. Um, you know, where and what was the point of all that? Well, Did I don't. Work it out? I I don't fully know, but I mean, I think they're going through. But that'll be what'll be in the closing yeah, speeches. Yeah, and I think if I think as well, the defence are looking at you know the pixelation. They're discussing that with the Gardaí. That was a request to the Gardaí of the the pixelation of the photograph in the front of the Sunday World. Um, also, then yesterday there was. Uh, uh, there was a, a taxi man was brought through about the cloning of plates and this is not to do with Jerry Hutch in particular but to do with the um, Paul, Murphy. Paul Murphy who the you know who features less in the coverage but they're there as part of um, they're on, on trial as part of this charge with facilitating, facilitating the murder by basic, providing the getaway vehicles exactly so they brought through um, there was a witness brought through about how plates can be cloned uh, taxis can be cloned how regularly this happens so there was there was some of that evidence um so a lot of it has not been you know this is normal for for court cases i suppose earlier in the week detective superintendent david gallagher of the drugs and organized crime bureau was brought back now he initially was brought into the courtroom he was to go into the box and there was a bit of a legal what I like to call Argy Bargy. Argy Bargy, right. And uh, he was sent away. Yeah. <laughs> I'm laughing. Yeah. And then he was brought back. And when he did go into the box, he gave that evidence about the Hutch Organised Crime Group, what it was. Yeah. He talked about it being a family run organisation yeah. with a strong patriarchal Yeah, not not so much a hierarchical leadership. structure but yeah. a kind of a people cooperating and based around family yeah. familial ties. Familial ties and that yeah. they would they would work together sometimes but separately, separately well. other times, right? Yeah. Okay. So he was brought back and he was asked about by um by Brandon Grehan, senior counsel, about who represents Jerry Hutch, about the Eddie Hutch murder and the suspects. Yeah. So we know who the other suspects are, but um, I think the questions that were being put to Gallagher were, were, are they in the jurisdiction? Yeah. And he didn't want to answer. I think he he answered that there had been investigations into it and they believed four people were responsible. But I mean, um, I think some of it is to do with building an overall picture on on, on, on what happened um, and how these things are going to be summed up. Um, there's clearly... The evidence against Jerry Hutch has now been heard. There mm. is nothing more to come. So I think people are trying to build an overall picture in terms of... And obviously that journey by Jerry Hutch with Dowdall to the north when they're talking about giving these yokes to yes. the dissidents. And when they meet dissidents, that journey happened after Eddie Hutch was murdered. And in that car journey... Jerry Hutch is very animated about the dangers to his family, to innocent people getting shot and is giving that really to Dowdall as the reason that he's kind of doing anything to try and get this thing stopped yeah. and that there's much more to come if they don't get a mediator in. So presumably that'll yeah. be used as part of that. Yeah, I think there's, they're trying to build an overall picture, mm. you know, of, of what Jerry Hutch's involvement is and why his motivation and those types of things there was also a guard brought back in um to discuss uh the 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 notes taken during the initial interviews with Jonathan Dowdle oh yeah um th these are the interviews that Jonathan Dowdle spoke about at length as you know um <laughs> so obviously Jonathan Dowdle ultimately made a statement that statement's read into court um but we also heard during Jonathan Dowdle's testimony about his initial conversations with the guardie um, there was notes taken during these conversations, quite limited notes, but, you know, notes nonetheless. Um, the, the interviews, which were, I suppose, could you consider them off the record? Not fully off the record, but certainly not uh, formalised in the sense of, of written down and signed. Um, uh, so there was notes taken, but they weren't videotaped, which ultimately uh, the, the, the Jonathan Dowdles would be videotaped. So that was brought in again. There were some questions about that. Why, you know, what had happened then? Who took the, like, why the notes were taken in that form? Why they weren't? Who, who spoke? So again, I think that's, there was an attempt to, to get that into the record and also to cross, the cross-examination focused on why decisions were made around Jonathan Dowdle and, and for what purpose. Um, so it has been quite a technical. Mm. These are sort of like, you know, if you were doing some building work, 
uh, in a house this would be your final fix wouldn't it the, what's going yeah. on for the last couple of weeks it's just cleaning up loose ends and yes because it's going to be presented as an overall argument so like yeah. we know what, what the, the case against Jerry Hutch is it's not going to be his, his fingerprint is found on the gun and we have a video of him committing murder but it's going to be part of that this is an, a murder of joint enterprise and that jo- Jerry Hutch has played a key role. That's going to be the state's case. The defence's case is going to be that that evidence is not is not definitive enough. Both sides are trying to trying to build this picture, and they're going to see that picture put put forward before the courts. In in mm. in. And it's really so. We've heard the prosecution case, but it's the defence closing that'll be of interest to us because they will probably put some personal information about Jerry Hutch before the court that we may not have heard before about how he was feeling in the aftermath of the Regency and as his family began to come under attack and what he sort of feared about the the strength, the size and the vengeance, I suppose, of the Kinnahan mob. And, you know, that will be probably it might give us I'm speculating here, but it might give us an insight into where he was at at that time. Absolutely. I mean, it's going to be a, so it's going to there's got to be a very extensive closing speeches I would imagine because of the other two defendants that are there as well uh, you know the, the, in a normal case of events the, you would hear a lot more of them but because of the coverage given the nature of Jerry Hutch's position yeah. and, and you know the, you hear less of them so that could go on for a while um, and it will be very interesting and anything else engaging this week the only thing I was sort of was on a bit was the um this legislation that was being put through the doll or going through the doll about um, making it a criminal offence for people to groom children to commit a crime. So that's all very positive, even though five years doesn't sound like very much. Um, yeah, so it's sort of decriminalising the child, I suppose, and criminalising the adult who might have benefited from it. Yeah, I mean, it's an increasing feature. Um, and you, you saw it in particular up in, in, in Drogheda that we've spoken about, um, which is what we've always heard, that there was very young teenagers being sucked into that, asked to commit things like um, arson attacks. Mm. And obviously, Keen Mulready Woods was was one of those people who got sucked into parts of that lifestyle and ultimately was killed uh, very horrifically. So this is an attempt to address that Um because obviously that that's the part of which gang people get brought into gangland, and they are these young kids are really used because they have sort of it's it's regarded that they can they can get caught a few times without consequence. Um, there are value, I suppose, and you know that's the case of it. Some of them are brought in through fear. You know, they might owe money, or they might be just generally afraid, and they're asked to hold guns or drugs or move them or whatever and then some of them are brought in by that lure of that glittering lifestyle and all the trappings of it and he i think s- some of this has has been informed as well by um the so-called county lines gangs in the uk where it's it's been established now that you know you have these gangsters who are living well outside the cities and they're using they're re- basically recruiting vulnerable young teenagers from you know outside care homes and you know but but you know services not not what they used to be in the uk um, some of these kids are falling through the cracks. They're not at, they're not at school, um, and and they're being put on trains with um, you know deals of cocaine to go and sell in the inner city, mm. and that, you know and there's obviously there's there's always been an element of that in Ireland as well. Uh, you know where where you know as as Nye was saying that you, they're too young to get prosecuted, so they're persuaded. Look, nothing bad is going to happen to you, but you know you're getting involved with some very heavy individuals, and we do know of some young teenagers who, who have taken up quite serious roles in, in at least one particular gang. So, I mean, it is it is a phenomenon that's been, I suppose, visible in the UK and it's probably less visible here, but you, c- you can be sure it's happened. For sure. I mean, Brian Kenny used to collect Joey O'Callaghan from outside the school. He'd go in the front door, change in the bathroom and go out the back door and Kenny be waiting with the car when he was 12, 13. He'd drop him over to Ballymun Towers and keep giving him more and more heroin to sell. And he would speak about how terrified he was because... He was afraid of the drug dealers. He was afraid of having the money. He was afraid of having the drugs. He was afraid of Brian Kenny. So everything was afraid. And he, he sort of like as human being and as children do, he was a survivor. So he used to bury the money in a particular place that if he was shaken down, he wouldn't get so much. And of course, Kenny gave him cocaine to give him the confidence to go in. Yeah, He was talking about this. Is some of the towers would have been like crackdowns and he'd go in and he'd be dark and he'd 
kick the door and he'd ask if anybody wanted to buy and out of the darkness would come these voices and sometimes these sort of zombie like characters and I mean can you imagine that for a child yeah and of course it, with, with the kids that get dragged in they really get this bet into them you're about being a rat that yeah. that's the worst worst thing in the world and that really that's that's really part of that grooming process it is. and then the, the threats against their family which sometimes these threats can't be carried out but when you're Young kids certainly mm. have that fear, you know, and also the, the ability for them to be ostracised within their own community if they don't do what, what they're told, which is like an, uh, any kids going to school. That's always a fear, isn't it, for teenagers yeah. that they be, you know, uh, ostracised within their own group. So that that's really the way it works. It co- seems sort of complicated legislation, whether it can be, you know, but we see it in, in, ac- in action when it does finally go through, you know. <laughs> And you wonder in a way, like I know as a society, we've moved very far away from taking children from their families, from their parents and stuff. But if you have, you know, families that are actively involved, engaged in criminality and that the parents and the families themselves are grooming the children from a young age, you know, what do you do in that case? Well, do we I don't know what you do, but the, the, rea- like the reality is that it's so traumatic to take kids off their parents, even if they're, yeah. they're even if their circumstances are really quite bad. So that like so it but in England they do a lot of they do a lot of that they do a lot of that and since the baby P case yeah they do a lot of what's called uh, forced adoptions where they take kids in in bad circumstances and and really push it through but Ireland maybe takes a different stance that and it is true that children it's 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 kind of a no win circumstance because kids love their parents even if the parents are Mm. dysfunctional and 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 you know it it's very traumatic so it's a really really complicated problem to solve it's a difficult one but i mean if you kind of know if you leave the kid there in that environment that they are you know yeah 99 percent gonna end up involved in criminality themselves which will you know lead them to the dangers of being shot dead or yeah, whatever it's else like it's is no it irresponsible as a society to turn a, a, a blind eye at that and say oh well they love the parents so but would I don't know a, I would we leave a child in a home where they were being sexually abused well you wouldn't I mean that that is the truth they will take the you know children that are being sexually abused will be taken out of their that circumstance no matter what but yeah it's it, but it is a complicated problem I mean the, the, the has been shown that kids taken off their parents quickly or easily it does lead to another cycle of trauma and did like it actually just shows you how hard it is um to resolve these problems and people think why don't you just lock them up or do this or mm. build more playgrounds like it, they are really really complicated problems and they have to be but the way i kind of see it is that that legislation and you know it maybe is a long time coming and five years maybe isn't very much in the prison system but it's just another sort of weapon yeah in the armory against this fight we are having as a society against organized crime exactly and, and it's like when you look at a gang or you look at an individual and you're trying to take them you mightn't be able to get them for murder but you might be able to get them for this 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 and this and it's under the gangland legislation i think isn't it i think so yeah yeah, yeah. so i mean exactly these Which is look, proving to work we're seeing it all the time in the courts it is proving to work um uh, but you know the legislative solutions are part of the picture part there of it, has exactly, to be yeah. there has to be other things and and anybody who gives you tells you there's a simple answer to these things there isn't no. i mean it's a complicated problem but mm. yeah it's 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 i think it's a good it's a good piece of legislation and i think it, it once you see a couple of people come before the courts that'll that will put the fear into some people for doing this so mm. amen Fagan's Law, I think, is what it's called, you know, after the old Oliver Twist story, you know, when you're inveigling kids into crim- criminality. But I mean, I mean, Niall is, is it's certainly not understating it when you say how complex it is. I mean, we, I know you, you've done stories, Nicola. I think Niall has as well. And so have I about, you know, houses of horror, as they're often dubbed in, you know, in, in various media where kids have been, you know, at seriously at risk from negligence and you know, uh, addiction issues and all the rest. And so many times, like, you know, the the social services resources that are there aren't really adequate. Um, and it's unfair, I think, on, on some of the professionals who are expected to deal with, you know, deeply complex problems that aren't aren't going to be solved overnight. And, and certainly, you know, I mean, a baton charge isn't going to so- solve these issues. I mean, it's a, it's a it needs an incredibly long term approach to get mm. these things right. And, and the acceptance that you're not always going to get it right either. 
So, do you feel you've waffled enough for one week? Well, I think Eamon brought both a bit of dignity. No, to pr- Eamon definitely brought something. Brought a bit Fred, of dignity to proceedings. <laughs> I, I finished <laughs> <laughs> and he sort of is able to kind of like as we bah, 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 he's yeah. able to come up with the you yeah. know I like that I like now the, the style world will, the world will know he's never been to Lily's before close yeah our view you <laughs> someone will produce a, a video now will <laughs> I dancing with my my box of shorts on my head or something yeah so yeah and your Hawaiian shirt yeah where, where did you go <laughs> in your youth then not that you're ancient. If you, if you remember the 80s, you weren't there. <laughs> <laughs> and yourself? I it's didn't dark go places. far, Nicholas Sill, you know. Most boring man in Europe. Dark places. I really don't like when you call yourself that. I just mm. think there's enough people out there to call you that. <laughs> it's all right. It's, I can't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. You're just trying to. You're Most just trying exciting to get in. man in Europe. Then. You're just trying to get in before them, yeah, are you? Exactly. Get your insults in first. You yeah. Know. Anyway, look, it was the week that was in it, and um, we might sort of come back and have a little discussion next week and see what's been busying us. Yeah. And, and if you give me the bus fare, I'll actually go up to the studio as well, Nicola. <laughs> Will you? Yeah. And I'll send you to. Oh, it's not there anymore, Lily's. Of course. Where would I be sending them to now? Cri- uh, I'm not actually going to embarrass myself no. because I don't even know. Crystal, is Where that do a... people go nowadays? Like, does any of us know that? No, we don't. Can anyone we're, ring we're in? Definitely, or we're definitely text asked. me discreetly so as I can <laughs> not Eddie make too much show or myself. I'm sure there's all sorts of funky underground places out there. Sure and there is. Yeah. Anyway, okay. If you're there, you might let us know, and we can uh, list you all next week. So look, um, thank you both, and we shall reconvene. Absolutely. Thanks, Ikla. Alrighty.